It's Dwayne Wade week here on Locked on Heat. And if you haven't joined us so far this week, well, you've missed a lot. On Monday, we had our Rankapalooza Part 1, where we talked about Dwayne Wade's top five seasons, Dwayne Wade's top five moments, and his top five teammates. We were also, on Tuesday, joined by ESPN's Israel Gutierrez to talk about what it was like covering Dwayne Wade as a rookie, as a beat reporter for the Miami Herald, and then later uh, for ESPN, covering the big three Miami Heat and so on, and what it was that Dwayne Wade meant to South Florida sports then and now. And then uh, on Wednesday, we were joined by Wade's teammate Antoine Walker to tell stories about the 2006 NBA Finals. So all of that has already been done this week. For today's episode, we are thrilled to be joined by ESPN's George Sedano, who also covered Dwayne Wade from the early parts of his career. His first day, actually, uh, as a full-time reporter covering the Heat, was Dwayne Wade's first day as a member of the Miami Heat. So he's got a ton of great stories to share with us, including some of the behind-the-scenes stuff from his interviews and things like that, including uh, if Dwayne Wade regretted leaving Miami in 2016. Of course, he ultimately ended up coming back and finishing his Hall of Fame career here in Miami. So really fun episode for you today. Hope you enjoy. You are locked on heat. Your daily Miami Heat podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, really excited about this. We've got George Sedano here on the program. You've seen him on ESPN. Sideline reporting for NBA, Around the Horn. He's got his radio show at ESPN Los Angeles. Uh, George, thanks so much uh, for jumping on. Again, so excited to have you on because you've covered Dwayne Wade more than basically anybody else. I mean, you're as good as anybody to talk to about his career, obviously getting inducted to the Hall of Fame he is here. Um, I'm just going to throw it out to you. Super open-ended question to get things started. Favorite Dwayne Wade story from covering him? Ooh. Um, If I was going just on basketball... um... You know, to me, it's game three of the 2006 NBA Finals. I'm not going out like that, right? Like, I think to me, that's the one that sticks out immediately. And for people that don't recall, they were trailing by as many as 13 in the fourth quarter with six and a half to go. They're down 11 in the game. And that's when the famous I'm not going out like that uh, mention came up in that huddle. And they were down 0-2, right? Like, they lose that game, series is over, right? So I think that, to me, sticks out the most. He goes nuts, obviously scores nine points down the stretch in those last six and a half minutes, 15 points for the quarter. And they were the first finals team to come back down 13 in the fourth since 1992, game six Mm. of that finals between Wade's hero, Michael Jordan, childhood hero, and the Portland Trailblazers. So to me, that game immediately sticks out. On a personal level, uh, I'll never forget the day my dad passed away. One of the first messages I got was from him, and it could not have been a nicer message. Um, Just an incredible human being that I've gotten to cover for a very long time. I saw him recently at Summer League, and just, you know, I was running around really quick, so just made sure to say hello to him and his wife, Gabby. But yeah, to me, he is one of the most incredible human beings I've ever covered and continues to be. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I know it was an emotional moment. But you have written eloquently and wonderfully about that connection with your father and South Florida sports and everything that Dwayne Wade represented. And I, I could paraphrase some of it, but obviously I can't give it the kind of weight that you can. And you speak for so many South Floridians and sports fans in general about how how much Wade represents to them. So I was just wondering if you could please go into that and the importance of Dwayne Wade in, in your kind of sports career? Oh, I mean, there's not a more important player, really. I mean, I would say it's him, number one, probably LeBron, number two, because, uh, you know, LeBron did follow me to Los Angeles after I moved. <laughs> uh, but Obviously, I'm kidding. But, yeah, I mean, look, I, I started covering the NBA. The first day I covered the NBA, actually, when I think about it now, was the draft. <laughs> was Dwayne Wade getting drafted? And I, June 26, 2003 was the first day I covered the NBA full-time. And D. Wade gets drafted fifth to Miami. We all know the story. Pat Riley saw him in the Midwest Regional Final. 
take out his alma mater. Uh, and Dwayne had a triple double, 29, 11, and 11. And although most people don't remember that, they also did uh, think for a second to draft Chris Kamen in that particular oh, yeah. draft. Boy, I don't think you and I would be talking about Chris yeah. Kamen potentially on this podcast today. Oh, probably uh, no not. Back to Chris, but uh, they're just not the same player, right? But uh, yeah, I, I mean, my career took off because it just coincided with his rise and superstardom. So I got to see it all. And I got to see the end, too, which was pretty damn cool. You know what I mean? So even though I wasn't necessarily working in Miami anymore, ESPN allowed me the opportunity to cover a lot of his games, particularly down the stretch, you know, in the father prime year, as we like to call it. And, uh, yeah, I I don't think there's a more important athlete in my life uh, in regards to correlating the success to my own career. I've told him that, you know, uh, I, I would not be where I'm at if it weren't for him uh, being drafted to Miami and then becoming the incredible star both on and off the floor that he became. Well, let's sort of stay there with stories from your career. I was going back. You did an interview with him in 2018. And one of the things that stuck out to me, and we've been doing a bunch of interviews uh, for we're doing a whole week of Dwayne Wade content. We really haven't gotten to this portion of his career. You do an interview with him in 2018 asking him about leaving Miami in 2016. You asked him point blank, would you have done a do-over? Would you and the Miami Heat have do-over if you could have it? And he said, quote, I think we would do a lot of it over. We would do a lot of things over. Um, what do you think he meant by that? Do you think that there is regret or certainly was there regret at that point when you were talking with him? I got the sense that in retrospect, he clearly missed being in Miami, right? And being part of that organization. I think the time when he was gone – I think made the heart grow more fondly, right? When it came to Miami and the organization and the structure and everything he was used to, because it wasn't like that in the other places, you know what I'm saying? So I think that was part of it. I don't know if regret is the right word. I just think it allowed him to understand how much he enjoyed and loved being part of this community in Miami and that particular organization and understanding that, they were able to make it right, right, at the end of the day. And it took the unfortunate passing of of Hank in that situation, Henry Thomas, his longtime agent, also the agent for Udonis Haslam and Chris Bosh, for that matter. And, uh, you know, at his funeral, you know, we know the story, and and Dwayne and I talked about it, I believe, maybe in that interview, um, about how that moment really, you know, made him understand, oh, you know, maybe there is a path. And Udonis was the one that told me that he felt like there's no question that changed the trajectory of how everything went from that point on. So I I think that that's probably what he meant. I don't think regret was the right word. I would just say that he, he understood what he had better, right? That's probably the best way to describe it. Do you think there's any kind of lingering resentment? Because I know a lot of Heat fans see his ownership stake in Utah and the fact that he lives in Los Angeles and things of that sort. Of course, no knock on L.A. But I, I, people see how it played out in 2016. And despite the fact that he came back and was able to repair a lot of that burnt bridge, do you still see that there maybe is a little bit of tension between him and the front office or the ownership group to any degree? No, I don't get that sense. I just think that Dwayne is a smart businessman and Mm -hmm. the opportunity was there for him to do a smart business deal with a guy in in Utah. And, you know, Ryan's a great owner. Ryan and him are also much closer in age, right? Ryan and him have a lot more in common both off the floor. And I think it was just that. I just think it, it was a business relationship that spawned off into a really great personal relationship for him. So I, I don't think it has it's personal against Miami. I think the fans view it that way because sure. they view it through their own prism, right? Like he's their superstar, and how dare he? Uh, how dare the organization not offer uh, him that same stake with the team? And and I don't know if that was ever offered or not. I've never right. actually asked, to be honest with you. I'm sure other people may have dug into that. I've I've never really been interested in knowing. Uh, I just know that you know Ryan and Dwayne have a special relationship. And, you know, it's both, uh, you know, a special relationship, both from a business perspective and a personal perspective. And I think the move to L.A. was more about the family as well. Right. I think that, you know, Gabrielle wanted to go and start working more regularly again. And Mm -hmm. 
just harder to do that when you're not in Los Angeles, right? When you're an actress. So I think that played a role in it. And, you know, the kids growing up here. And I think that, remember, um, you know, his oldest son got a chance to play at Sierra Canyon in high school his last year, which is a basketball factory here in Los Angeles. All right. the famous NBA players' sons have played there, including Bronny James played there. Right. But guys like a former Heat player in Samaki Walker, whose son uh, oh, played yeah. at Sierra Canyon there um, with Zaire. So I think that I think just a lot of that stuff went into that particular decision. And I don't think it had anything really to do with uh, Miami or 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 the Heat or anything other than just what was best for their family. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Take your first swing at betting on Major League Baseball and get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets up to $200. That's right. Just bet 20 bucks and you'll lay $200 in bonus bets. Whether you win or lose, that's $200 that you can spend on betting on every everything from the money line to the over-under to who you think is going to hit the first home run. All on an app that's for, safe, secure, super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you get paid instantly. There's no better place to place a bet than on Major League Baseball than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And you sign up today, you visit FanDuel.com slash locked on, and you get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com. Dot com slash locked on FanDuel, the official partner of Major League Baseball. We'll move off of Dwayne Wade not playing in Miami in a second, but I just have one more question on this. Just in your opinion, him leaving Cleveland and then Chicago and then coming back, what kind of impact do you think that had on his legacy as we kind of take it all into account as he's getting inducted into the Hall of Fame? Um. I mean, not much really, you know, yeah. I, would it have been a, an incredible story had he done what Kobe and Dirk did and, you know, started and finished with the same team, you know, throughout without any, any changes. Sure. But I don't think it diminishes it at all in the least <laughs> Dwayne Wade. And I think you Wes had the stat right on your Twitter where <laughs> you could cut his points his total points in half and he'd still be the franchise leader in scoring. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I, I don't think it changes anything. And the fact that he came back, I think made the story just perfect. Right. Yeah. In the sense that that's more real to me because look, right. people forget. And I don't, I can't speak for Dirk, but people forget Kobe Bryant wanted out of LA out of the oh, Lakers yeah. at one point. I'll never yeah. forget at the dawn of camera phones. Right. He was caught by some kid in like a strip mall in Orange County asking him about trading for Jason Kidd and should they trade Andrew Bynum? And Kobe said something like, uh, yeah, of course we should trade Andrew Bynum for Jason Kidd. And, you know, Kobe almost went to the Clippers, almost went to the Bulls like Dwayne. Right. I mean, it was this close. Yeah. So these things are fickle, man. And, you know, look, I remember covering that saga. And I remember having those conversations with both sides when he left to Chicago and doing a ton of interviews during the time. I, I may have even written something. I don't even remember anymore. Um, but I just remember being up at dawn and going to sleep, you know, in the middle of the night, like chasing this stuff. And um, so for me, it was taxing. So I can't, I can only imagine how taxing it was for him. Uh, so yeah, but I, again, I don't think it diminishes anything. And I think the fact that he was able to come back and just punctuate his career uh, with the Heat, you know, they got, they, you know, they went to the playoffs uh, his second to last season, right? They did, uh, right. you know, they had, he had that one really good Dwayne Wade game against Philly. Uh, and then, you know, the, the last year, the big shot against Golden State, which was crazy. Yep. Uh, and that was, you know, Golden State, three out of four championships, Golden State, right? Yep. Uh, and then, you know, the, the last home game where he almost hurt himself uh, trying to yep. get on the scorer's <laughs> table. And that's oh, what he, he probably he jokingly said, right, that he knew he was hanging it up at that point. But interestingly enough, there was a question, well, is he going to play in his last game in Brooklyn? And then there was that, you know, the the fitting last assist to Udonis Haslam. Oh, you know, and then you got the, the banana boat guys there and Carmelo and LeBron and Chris there to watch it. It worked out fine, man. Uh, you know, was it picture perfect? No, but life is not picture perfect. Um, yeah, maybe not the braids. Maybe would have gotten rid of those <laughs> in terms of the picture perfectness. But that's just, you know, it's not, I'm not in that's charge of that. That's him to decide. I thought it looked cool. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, just uh, 
I actually, in thinking about it, I think it helped his legacy to leave and then come back because you mentioned like the Kobe thing. We kind of forget that Kobe really kind of hamstrung those Lakers rosters with the sat with the contract and everything those those years. The whole conversation around Kobe, like those last two or three years, was I can't believe the Lakers gave him that contract and now they can't do anything because of this contract. And the Heat never had to operate under the weight of a big Dwayne Wade paying him for what he had done type of deal. And he comes back on a reasonable contract and is able to be the hero coming off the bench and doing all the things that you just talked about. So I actually think it maybe helped his legacy because he never had that weird thing at the end uh, where his contract was an issue. Um, I w- Let's just completely reverse it. Beginning of his career. How important was Eric Spolstra in Dwayne Wade's success and vice versa? Like, how helpful were they together? Why was that partnership? Oh, yeah, it it was big. Um, you know, Eric was the developmental coach at the time, and nobody worked with Dwayne in his shooting more than Eric did back in those days. Yep. I used to see him, you know, before games, practice, etc. So, yeah, I, I mean, they have a bond uh, that's as unique and wonderful as any player and coach, if you think about it. And it's crazy because, you know, you know, Spo, it's all well documented, right? The video room, you know, back bench, sure. you know, and eventually getting his way to becoming the head coach, you know, to have that ride can be a blessing and a curse. And I'm sure they would both tell you that where it's hard to go from being the guy who was helping the superstar, you know, help him with the shot development shagging balls for him then you know assistant etc you're you're always the good guy more times than not when you're the assistant to having to be the lead guy and you know I would imagine Spo will tell you that there was a lot of growth that had to be done look if it was Dwayne being drafted you know uh, now right when Spo is a two-time champion he's one of the 15 greatest coaches in NBA history by the NBA and all that stuff it would be different but I think that their relationship, because it started literally, you know, not to quote Drake, right, but started at the bottom and now they're here. You know what I mean? But it 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 creates a lot of different layers to it. And I think without those layers, they wouldn't be as close as they are today. And those layers doesn't always include always, you know, loving each other every second of the moment. Right. And I think there were some challenges throughout that time, as we saw some of them play out in real time. So, but you know, if there's anything you know about Spo, he embraces that stuff. Yeah. And I think, you know, Dwayne certainly does too, right? Because he grew up in this culture. And, and I think that their bond, man, is just, it's great to watch. And, and it's, I, I, I know all those guys who played for him, you know, see Co- Coach Spo now and are just like, they, they, they love it, right? They just, they love to see what he's turned into. So, yeah, I, I think an, an incredible relationship that started really, you know, very much in, uh, you know, the shadows in a lot of ways and practices and things of that nature. I was hoping to ask you about those two years in between the Shaq era and the big three era, because I think a lot of today's fans kind of forget how good Dwayne was individually. And when we're talking about. Yeah. He was the MVP of the league, in my opinion, he got his, I, I think he should have been the MVP of the league in that 2008 season, 2009 season, 809, whatever it was after the Olympics. Um, yeah. and yeah, like he, he was incredible, right? Led the league in scoring. Um, no one meant more to his team. We, you know, to your point, uh, those teams were not very well constructed. You know, they right. were, um, a mix of really, really, really green and young players, um, and some vets. And that's hard, man. Like that's a hard team to coach and you have a superstar, right? Who wants to win and was, had already won. And that is such a hard thing to keep together. But you're right. Uh, that to me was peak prime D Wade and the highest of the highs. He was as as good as anyone was in the league at that time. And, and to your point, like a first year coach too. Like, I mean, how many teams do we see with like a first year head coach? Absolutely bomb. And yet the individual greatness of Dwayne was able to carry those teams to a playoff berth in two years. And yet at the same time, it kind of like is held against him when we're looking at his overall legacy because he needed Shaq to win. He needed LeBron to win. You know, the Heat didn't treat him well in 2016. It's just this myriad number of excuses. But when you just look at his individual greatness in those two years, I, I think he was as good as any one player in the NBA at that point in time. A hundred percent. I think, again, I would have given him the MVP that year. He finished behind LeBron and Dwight, I believe, uh, yep. in that year. 
And that was the closest he got to winning an MVP. But yeah, I, I just think that when you look at him and you look at his body of work, you know, did he need play? I mean, everybody needs players. You know what I'm Absolutely. saying? Like, you know, magic, uh, Kareem, uh, you know, right. need magic, right? Like people right. forget we can go back that far. Um, you know, the Celtics were a juggernaut, but certainly be, went to a completely different level after a, a quick lull, you know, uh, with Larry Bird, right? So it just, and, and they had a ton of guys, Mikhail, Parrish, et cetera. Um, you know, Jordan needed Pippen. What was Jordan before Pippen? So it, we can do this dance all along. There are some outliers here and there of teams like the Detroit Pistons who were a team, right? right. Uh, I guess you can make the case Dirk in 2011 is, is one of those mm. outlier situations. Although he had Hall of Famer Jason Kidd on his team and a lot of really good players on that team. Like right, that team right. from top to bottom depth-wise was pretty stacked. Yeah. So yeah, we, we, we don't talk about Brian Cardinal on this show. Sorry. Okay. Right. Yeah, we don't have to talk about Brian Cardinal. You know what I'm saying? But uh, Or J.J. Barea. But, oh. uh, but yeah, I mean, that team – you know, Tyson Chandler was a defensive player of the year type candidate player, right? Jason Kidd was still yeah. Jason Kidd. Uh, yep. I mean, that team wasn't like it was Dirk dragging a bunch of dudes. You know what I mean? Like there were there were a lot of really good players in that team. But nonetheless, uh, I, I think that stuff is silly. If anything, to me, that shows um, how willing he is to win, right? His willingness to win is that he's willing to share the spotlight. Now, um, with Shaq, he was a young player. It just is what it is. But the LeBron stuff, he was his equal basically at one point. Oh, you know what I'm sure. saying? And it was his city, his town. So to have that conversation before they went on that vacation, that famous vacation in the Bahamas after the Dallas loss, to have that conversation before and tell LeBron, this needs to be your team. We need to play around you and you need to be comfortable. That's an incredible sign of maturity in a game and a sport and, and, and particularly just an industry where ego gets in the way a lot. Okay. And for him to have the foresight to say, no, 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 no. This is the way it needs to go. Like not a lot of guys are willing to do that. George, I know we only have you for a little bit more. We're going to quick lightning round. We call this flashcards, easy stuff here. Um, top five players who impacted heat culture. Well, Dwayne Wade, number one, most important player in franchise history, hands down, not even a close second, okay, to me. So let's sure. start there. Um, then after that, it gets tricky, okay? I would still say LeBron at number two, okay? Ooh. I would still have LeBron at number two because I, you're talking about arguably the greatest player in the history of the sport coming to the Miami Heat in his prime, okay? And again, let's not forget, dealing with the aftermath that he dealt with, no player uh, before, or ever has since dealt with the ramifications of free agency the way LeBron James did. Not Kevin Durant, not anyone, okay? Forget it. It's not even close. Like, LeBron dealt with an aftermath that we've never seen again, okay? So, to me, LeBron is still number two. Uh, this is where it gets tricky for me. Um, I still have Shaq as number three, okay? Ooh. I still have Shaq as number three because without Shaq coming to Miami, I don't think you get the first title. Dwayne was obviously the guy that led them there, but I'm, you know, I know Heat fans think fondly of the Karan Butler, Lamar Odom teams, but that team's not winning a championship. Okay. No. Um, and Shaq came to Miami towards the end of his prime and was able to help deliver a championship. And people forget in that run in 2006, okay, off a season where Shaq probably should have won the MVP the prior season where Steve Nash won, he and they would have maybe won the year before had uh, Dwayne not gotten hurt. Remember, he had the busted rib in the yep, Detroit right. series in the conference finals. So Shaq coming here, delivering on his promise to bring a championship to Miami, averaging 20 and 10 for that entire playoffs. So it's not like Shaq was, no, you know, was some shell of himself. You know, Avery Johnson kept doubling and tripling him. So he didn't score a ton in that series. But prior to that, he did really well in the Detroit series and the Chicago series and all the series prior to that. Yep. So, uh, yeah. So I still have Shaq at three. Then I've got Jimmy at four. I've got wow. Jimmy Butler at four right now. And I think because of the two finals appearances, doing things that I don't think anyone foresaw happening. I think people thought they'd be really good. I don't think people saw two, finals appearances in that stretch and three out of four Eastern Conference finals appearances in that stretch. So Jimmy Butler has far exceeded expectations to me. 
in a Miami Heat uniform, and hopefully they can, uh, you know, close the deal for him mm -hmm. and win a championship in his window. We'll see what this offseason brings in that regard. And then Zoe, to me, is number five. Zoe, to me, is number five because he was the original um, guy that Riley really traded for and kind of helped build the backbone of this culture. So, to me, it's, it's Zoe. And honorable mention to guys like Tim Hardaway and Chris Bosh. Udonis. Udonis Haslam, obviously. Yeah, those guys get kind of like an honorable mention to me. Um, you know, I, I would say that they're all like – if Zoe is five, then the other ones are five A, B, and C, you know? You got it. Last one. Build a team. You've got prime Dwayne Wade, MVP level Dwayne Wade, right? Uh, you get to build a starting lineup with four current NBA players around him to go win a championship this year. What's your team? So we're talking about guys today in 2023 or in their prime? Correct. Uh, 2023, 2023 players. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So I would have Steph Curry as my point guard. Yep. First, first one that has done that. I thought that was such an obvious one. Keep going. Yep. Yeah. Steph Curry is my point guard. Um, this is where it gets harder. Okay. Um, Nikola Jokic as my center. Mm. Um, Giannis Antetokounmpo as my power forward. And then my small forward. Mm. That one's tough. Do I want like some more shooting? I mean, mm. I've got decent shooting with, with Nikola on top and obviously incredible shooting with Steph. Right. Um, I've got Giannis, who's the freak of nature, right? Um, so I've got defense with Giannis and Dwayne. Um, man, this is a tough one because I, I don't – do I go with, like, the veteran savvy at this stage of his career with, like, LeBron? Right. Um, or actually, you know what? Here's what I do. I move Giannis to the three. Wow. And I'm going to go Anthony Davis at the four. Wow. So that way, I've got a defensive component with an incredible offensive skill set, right? So I've got Jokic as my center. AD really is the guy defending the bigs, but mm -hmm. AD is one of the best defenders in the sport and can can defend perimeter players. Giannis obviously can do some of that too, um, and has uh, you know the incredible physical attributes even more so than Anthony Davis has. You got Steph shooting, and then D Wade in his prime. I think you've got a wild team. Why? Who did who did who did I miss that other people used? KD. Uh, KD is a good one. KD yeah. is a good one. Yeah, I just felt like you know. I think the, to me the thing is just like I wanted to build a team that would be super healthy around Dwayne. <laughs> and I, I look as as great as KD is, right? Like I, I just thirty five, right? Like the injuries. Yeah. But I guess if you're telling me I got to win a championship this year. All right, maybe I would substitute KD. If I have Anthony Davis, I may not need Giannis. Right. So, yeah. So, in that scenario, I'd probably put KD. Because I don't – if I've got – Giannis and AD, there's some duplication there. Um, okay. But it would be hard as hell to score on Giannis and AD. Yeah, I like um, that. I like that defense Dwayne a lot. Wade, you know. So, I'm going to go the Spo route and I'm, I'm going to – I'm going to surpass KD and go defense, right? Going to grind it out, play in the mud. Don't let go of the rope, right? All oh, the sayings. I feel and like I'm in a press conference here. Sorry. I, I'm to give flashbacks. Right, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. you know, I will use my trained eye to tell you right. I will lean defense. Some and ignitable that, shooters coming off the bench. I, I say that jokingly. <laughs> I say that jokingly because Ramona Shelburne is a good friend of mine. Yes. Uh, everybody had – Every ignitable shooters off the bench. That's, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You go more offense off the bench yeah. for sure. Uh, KD, everybody, KD be my sixth man or Devin Booker. Devin Booker, sure. KD be my sixth man. There you I go. I was gonna say Booker would be good. Yeah, everybody picked Jokic. Uh, you and Antoine Walker's teams are very similar. Okay, I don't know I if that matters it. to you. Me and Twan, um, the shimmy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, George Sedano does great work at ESPN, uh, ESPN Los Angeles radio show, uh, which you can tune in because of the internet wherever you are. So um george thanks so much this was fun man you got it guys thanks for having me sorry for being late for those that are wondering uh you probably did not say this but i will tell people i was 10 minutes late to this because i'm actually writing a d wade script for an essay for sports center for his hall of fame induction and i lost track of time because i was going down the d wade rabbit hole uh but this will help help me finish it for sure so thank you guys. that's great
That's great. <laughs> Thanks, man. All right, guys. See ya.